to me, it is a form of hunting. Mm -hmm. Like first and foremost, I mean, you have to know all the, you have to have all the skills and knowledge that a hunter has, Mm -hmm. you know, able to stalk an animal to a close range because you have to get really close to get a very quality picture. Yeah. Uh, You have to be cognizant of the wind direction. You have to be cognizant of your camouflage, your scent, Mm -hmm. all those things that a hunter thinks about. But you also have to be conscious of your camera settings, you know, your equipment. You have to know about, um, like the light, wh- which way is the light coming from? How is this image going to be composed? Mm-hmm. The environment that you're in, the elements in that. Uh, if there's a single grass blade in front of your subject, it could ruin it. Yep. So, I mean, you got to have all that in mind. Uh, so it's like being a hunter, but like an artist, a scientist, and everything else. This is the Aptitude Outdoors podcast, where we interview conservationists, hunters, anglers, and outdoorsmen and women to bring you the greatest stories, information, and advice from the best in the world. I'm a huge fanatic for handmade, high-quality leather and canvas products. In my opinion, they last longer, hold up better to the abuses of travel, and honestly, they just look really cool. That's why I use Badger Claw Outfitters. They've been making handcrafted products for hunting, camping, and travel since 2011, and that's right up my alley. The best part is they're made right here in the USA and are guaranteed for life. They've got everything from gun leather, belts, custom knife sheets, wallets, duffel bags, leather and canvas pouches, everyday carry items, and more. Badger Claw Outfitters, made in the USA, built for the wild. This episode was recorded live at the 2023 Hunt Fish Podcast Summit, where podcasters and guests from across the country come together to talk about their passions for hunting, fishing, and conservation. This year's summit is brought to you by Waypoint TV, Ron Hoover Marine of Galveston, Spot Stalker Guide Service, the Wild Sheep Foundation, Galveston Fishing Company, Captain Experiences, and Badger Claw Outfitters. One of the things that interests me most is a lot of hunters and you know anglers spend a lot of time trying to like learn all these tips and tricks and this stuff but for me i think like from your perspective learning about like entomology and how ecosystems work i think that's the best hunting and fishing tool i don't know (laughs) if you would agree with that but i mean i think that's better than any gear you can buy i mean yeah like just equipping yourself with knowledge for sure i mean is an understanding like all the little facets and little minute details in an Mm -hmm. ecosystem. I mean, it definitely, it gives you such a greater appreciation, I think, for like the outdoors and for, you know, food webs and landscapes and stuff. That's like, you know, so much of it we don't even understand. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like when you get into like the research aspect of a lot of it, I mean, there's so much we know and so much we don't know. And I think it's it's cool because like when you study one species, like turkeys, for example, you learn that like everything is connected Mm -hmm. in an ecological, you know, framework or like a web. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just super cool. It's like the, what influences or the macro invertebrates in the river system influence, you know, these, this terrestrial system Mm -hmm. and influences the turkeys, you know, the big game, uh, you know, the vegetation communities around a river system, it's all connected. Mm -hmm. So if we have any kind of influence on one part of the system, that's going to in change some other part of the system yeah well i think a lot of there's a lot of misunderstanding of how all this stuff works because like you go to school for all the way through high school you don't really learn anything about wildlife Mm -hmm. you learn about history and math and all this stuff but we don't really touch on wildlife too much at least where i grew up and if unless you have that perspective people like say with wild sheep they have this this idea like well why can't you just come up with something and fix them like this is a whole (laughs) larger scale problem it's not as simple as like fix the one animal there's Mm -hmm. so many interconnected issues that work throughout the whole ecosystem that screw this stuff up it's not like there's no simple solutions to these problems there really aren't there is no simple solution there's no silver silver bullet to like any of these complicated issues Mm -hmm. Um, because you know I think there's so much that we can't control Mm -hmm. in an environment. We can't control weather. We can't control certain parameters that it's like you can do everything you can possibly to control the land that you're on, but you still can't control how much rainfall you get. And so that in turn is like it's going to affect your populations. It's going to affect your satisfaction with, you know, your populations Uh levels and such. But um, 
Yeah, it's it's a complicated issue for sure. And the only time that landowners are really happy with biologists is when everything's alive. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, it's like, and it looks they look like they're doing a great job, but it's like, well, did we like you know it rained really well that year, so yeah, yeah things are going to grow. <laughs> yeah, and, and wildlife aren't static, and everything things are constantly going to change. But like you bring in the human factor, and we just come in and do the weirdest stuff ever, <laughs> and we mess up whole ecosystems. We don't even realize it. Mm-hmm. And like so, you're studying wild turkeys. You do you studied entomology. You studied all this stuff. How do how do bugs and turkeys interact? Like what's their their relationship? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, turkeys, so I'll just start with like with a turkey poult because uh, that's, and arthropods and insects are extremely important to turkey poults. So as they get older, invertebrates become less and less of a thing, component mm-hmm. of their diet. But that first like three weeks that a poult is alive, he's almost only consuming insects. Okay. And so insects at like the ground level. And because that's what's available to them. And they're consuming stuff like beetles, grasshoppers, leaf hoppers, um, caterpillars and stuff like that. So the, the purpose of my research is we're looking at how are these turkeys using um, arthro- different arthropod communities mm-hmm. in a river system. So my research is in the Llano River uh, near Junction in the hill country. So this is like a, a historical stronghold for turkeys, uh, Rio really? Grande wild turkeys. And so we're all, we're interested, like, how is this population staying stable? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we could look, we look at all kinds of different parameters of, you know, what's going on in the system, but we want to see, we're, we're specifically looking for us at the river and the differences in those uh, insect communities. So we're sampling in like upland areas, riparian areas, and the aquatic sampling in the river. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this river system has a lot of cool aquatic invertebrates like mayflies, caddisflies yeah. that have these seasonal hatches. Uh, it's a really big deal to like fly fishermen, and um, you know people tend to take, tend to take notice of that yeah. during the seasonal parts of the year. Mm-hmm. So we want to know like are those turkeys u- utilizing any of those um, insects and like the nutrients that they bring from an aquatic system to a terrestrial land system. So it's all stuff that really hasn't been documented before. Really? Uh, we may find that there's no connection at all, <laughs> but that's science. And, yeah. you know, you can only do, you can only pick up on what's there. Um, but I think it's, it would be really interesting to find, like, are these turkeys utilizing like a specific uh, insect species? Are they like targeting like a certain uh, area or like mm-hmm. an insect community in the upland versus the riparian? Um, just to see those differences. And then how can we manage those systems better for arthropod communities and then in turn for turkeys? Uh, because we want to be uh, especially cognizant of like those critical time periods like yes. that a turkey poult needs arthropods. So maybe during the brooding season, you're going to want to manage for those specific areas to booster your arthropod communities. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of stuff that like, you know, we don't really, we haven't really discussed it. It's not really discussed well in the literature. So I'm, I'm really excited. It's kind of like research that's never been done before in this area. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because bugs usually are the least of people's concerns, but they're like <laughs> essentially above microorganisms. Bugs are like the base level for a lot of what goes on. Oh, in, yeah. In a lot of stuff. So what drew you to bugs? Because they are cool. <laughs> like if you were to go shrink down to their scale, it'd be like a whole different planet you would be on. It'd be insane. It is. It's it's really always fascinated me. So like, you know, growing up, um, I was, my family does a lot of wildlife photography. Uh, Dave Richards uh, his photographs a lot of white-tailed deer. Uh, he's my dad. And so grew up doing all this photography stuff. And you know, I would go with him on trips to the photo blinds, like before I could even see outside the blinds <laughs> and uh, just sitting there, you know, like, yeah. hey, the deer's coming in. Like, OK, cool, yeah, <laughs> I believe you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so growing up doing that, I got involved in photography and he taught me what I know today. Um, but some of the things that I picked up were uh, macro photography and I like to photograph you know, everything. Mm-hmm. I like to photograph invertebrates, especially because it's really like kind of instant gratification and it, invertebrates are everywhere. Yeah. They're easy to find. Uh, people rarely notice them. Mm-hmm. And so I love showing people photos of like these invertebrates. It's like, this was all in my backyard, like in, you know, Texas Hill Country. And there's, you know, red jumping spiders and really colorful grasshoppers and, you know, all kinds of really interesting stuff that not many people really pick up on. Yeah. Um, so I love exposing like that 
uh, micro world and, you know, all the cool things that come with it. Uh, and so when I was at a and pursuing my wildlife and fisheries degree, I realized I could get a double major in entomology. Mm. Uh, and that never even occurred to me, but I was like, yeah, I would love to take like bug classes. Yeah. Uh, and I had a ball with that. That was so much fun getting to um, go in the field and like collect insects and then working, like doing the academic stuff and learning in, in classes in college, all about like the biology of these species and how important they are for, like you said, the base, like the bottom level of like the trophic level and the food web. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's stuff that like we don't know very much about, like the full influence and impact that these invertebrates have on something as big as a turkey yeah. and other game species. So it's it's kind of this huge um, study field that like is constantly, constantly growing. Um, and so not many people consider entomology uh, as a field of major and stuff. But when I was at A&M, it's like I was asking people all the time, like, so what's your major? Or like, what, what got you into this? And they're like, oh, well, I was in business accounting, but then I found out about entomology, so I switched. <laughs> Smart move, to be completely honest. Oh, Got yeah. Got enough business people out there. Maybe more <laughs> entomologists to understand the food web and, and oh, how yeah. that affects wildlife. So I think weirdly, one of, well, not weirdly, but one of the few groups of, of uh, you know, consumptive outdoor users or like recreational fishermen that know about entomology is fly fishermen. They're uh -huh. always talking. That's like the first thing you hear when you start learning about fly fishing is entomology this, entomology that. Mm -hmm. And it it's really important. I mean, do, do you ever, you know, think about that while you're out in the field? Like, man, if I had a rod with me, right now, <laughs> I, could, I could be catching some bass. Or oh, whatever. yeah, all the time. I'm always looking at what's hatching in the river. You mm -hmm. know, I, look, I like to look and flip over rocks and stuff and see what's growing. Like, what is what nymphal stage is this insect in right now? Cause like, if you know, if you know that information, heck that's going to increase your fishing success like tenfold. Cause you know what that fish is eating at that time. And it changes on a dime. Like mm -hmm. it changes within hours sometimes of, of what those in like those insect emergences and the fish are keyed in on that. So you gotta be sh throwing that fly. That's like, the perfect nymphal stage, the perfect egg stage or adult stage. I mean, and you, that's something that I think lots of people like fly for fishermen are really keyed in on watching mm -hmm. that. Um, and as you know, an entomologist, it's like that y'all we're best friends. Like you, you want to know what I know about what this insect is doing. Yeah. So uh, I don't do a whole lot of fly fishing myself because heck I have so many hobbies, right. uh, hunting, regular fishing and uh, photography and, everything else it's like i don't have money yeah. for fly fishing it is <laughs> it's tough so well it's funny that you talk about you do your work on the lano river like i'm from ohio and and i know where that is because we just were fishing there the other day mm -hmm. and so like say if, if i wanted to study get just dropped off on any river how would i go about finding the bugs that i needed to know like mm -hmm. what i was if i was going to fish like where would i what like I would just start turning over rocks get in the water underwater rocks like where do i look yeah i mean flipping over rocks is a good good start because you can see what is in that river system right now mm -hmm. and you can see like oh well there's a little caddis fly or like a egg case or maybe a helgramite or something it's like okay what kind of fly do i have that matches that or as closely as you can get um, because, and also just like throwing an entire, like, uh, like a rig where you have like the dry fly, you have attached that, the nymph, and then maybe something else trailing it. And then you have like the whole gambit of, you know, what could be going on in that river. And then the fish is just going to say, oh, I want that one. You yeah. know, give him a, give him a buffet or a smorgasbord, not just one fly. Um, but also just paying attention to what's hatching around the river system. So I look in like the tall grass on the trees, like what kind of insects are, you know, emerging from that river right now. And they're, they're grabbing onto these, um, you know, vegetation and they're shedding their exoskeleton, their final molt, and then their adults. Um, if you can pay attention to that, um, you can definitely know what's hatching in that river. Cause it's a whole lot easier to find an adult insect. And it's like, okay, I know what this is mm -hmm. versus what's this like, little cruddy nymph that's you know the size of like my fingertip <laughs> yeah yeah it's hard hard to tie on <laughs> yeah it's really hard to tie on it's hard to identify and yeah you know you need like a microscope <laughs> yeah so let's let's talk on wildlife photography because i love wildlife photography awesome uh, it is i don't know i think i think if more hunters got the chance to do wildlife photography, they'd realize how similar it is to hunting. Oh yeah. Because you have to have the same level of 
understanding the wildlife, you also have to have the same level of like stealthiness to mm-hmm. be able to photo even something like a deer. Oh yeah. You still have to be able to get close to mm-hmm. get a good photo of them. And it's just, there's no killing with it, but it's still a very, very great tool for like understanding. So even in off seasons and stuff, uh-huh. it's like working on your hunting skills. Oh yeah. It's, to me, it is a form of hunting. Mm-hmm. Like first and foremost, I mean, you have to know all the, you have to have all the skills and knowledge that a hunter has, mm-hmm. you know, able to stalk an animal to a close range because you have to get really close to get a very quality picture. Yeah. Uh, you have to be cognizant of the wind direction. You have to be cognizant of your camouflage, your scent, mm-hmm. all those things that a hunter thinks about. But you also have to be conscious of your camera settings, you know, your equipment. You have to know about, um, like the light, which way is the light coming from? How is this image going to be composed? Mm-hmm. The environment that you're in, the elements in that. Uh, if there's a single grass blade in front of your subject, it could ruin it. Yep. So, I mean, you got to have all that in mind. Uh, so it's like being a hunter, but like an artist, a scientist and everything else. Yeah. And, you know, with hours and hours spent in like a photo blind, like you said, we pick up on all these really cool behaviors and we get to interpret all this animal behavior that so many, so few people get to see, mm-hmm. um, you know, and you get to capture it forever and, and capture it. And, you know, cameras and photography, it's like a really cool management tool, a scientific tool mm-hmm. to be used because for me, especially it's like a record of all the cool memories and like cool experiences I've had in the field. And I can go back and look at those at any time and be like, oh yeah, on March 15th, yeah. you know, this, this happened, uh, this, you know, I saw these insects emerging or I saw this, you know, turkey behavior that I've never seen before at any other time of the year. It's scientific documentation. It's raw data yeah. um, that you can show other people. So, and the applications nowadays for like with citizen science, and you know, we have these amazing f- phone cameras now. So, like, mm-hmm. literally, you, doesn't take much. You can carry a really quality camera with you everywhere you go. Yeah. Just change the game. Yeah, and I, I really like. I got into the telephoto game, and I'm like doing bird photography, and I would argue that it's harder than shooting like a gun. Yeah. <laughs> like like it, like like if you if you're bird hunting and you just have a shotgun and it just sprays whatever like oh, yeah. you have you have to intimately know your camera's settings you have to be able to change all of your settings on the fly mm-hmm. or set the proper settings to auto or, or and just knowing how it works intimately and being able to do that in an instant and then get the focus correct and the lighting correct and mm-hmm. you have maybe especially with birds like little warblers or something you have like a second, second. or set two seconds to nail that picture it's probably like one in every four 50 to 100 photos is good. Oh, yeah. I would say it's more difficult than hunting because, like you said, like if you're a hunter, all you want is that you just need a one shot. Mm-hmm. You need that bird to be exposed, for like for, let's just say, for turkey for, for one second. He just has to present a shot mm-hmm. and then it's over. Mm-hmm. But with like photography, that bird's, you know, he's aware, he's wary all the freaking time. And so you got to be super, super still, you know, almost motionless. And you have to do that for as long as they're there. I mean, yeah. it doesn't just end. It's like you have to trick that bird for a whole long time. Yeah. Uh, and then you get to see all the really cool, you know, behaviors that unfold right before your eyes. And, you know, that's what makes it like a super cool experience. Like, for example, I uh, just came back this week from photographing wild turkeys in South Texas and um, it, they are very difficult to photograph like mm-hmm. one of the hardest subjects I could say like don't start photographing with turkeys no. they are so freaking tough and you know they see the smallest movement they're gone mm-hmm. they don't like something they see something the color they don't like they're gone um, and even like photographing their iridescence of their feathers and stuff to capture that in your with your settings and all that is just so tough. difficult I almost prefer a cloudy day with turkeys because, yeah. like, you don't have to worry about that because it's it's just overexposed and like they have so many beautiful iridescent photos or iridescent feathers in their plumage. It's mm-hmm. just like it's hard to capture, you know, what your eye sees versus what the camera interprets. Turkeys are difficult. Ducks are difficult. Ducks are. It's so funny because people have this um, thought about ducks like these dumb things that swim at the park or whatever and. <laughs> If you go out in the wild and try and photograph or hunt ducks, it is <laughs> the most frustrating thing. Like deer are frustrating. Yes, I understand. Mm-hmm. 
ducks are infinitely more frustrating. Like if you understand the basics of deer, like wind, Mm -hmm. direction, and pretty much anything base level, you can probably get a deer. Mm -hmm. But ducks, like if you look up and they see the whites of your eyes for an instant, the whole flock is gone and you blew it for for probably another hour or something. Oh yeah. So that like people don't take that into account. And I'm with, I haven't sat in a blind to photograph ducks, but I could imagine like the camera lens shimmering or something would just send them off just the same. Oh yeah. The light catching of reflecting off your lens. It's over. Yeah. They see that. They're like, Nope, don't trust it. Yep. (laughs) Yep. So it is fun. And I, what's, what are some of your favorite subjects to photograph? I know you already kind of talked about Turkey and Mm -hmm. anything. Is there any other like big game or is just something that you really have on a list that you want to, that you need to get a photo of? Well, I've mentioned it to a few other people at this summit, and one of the coolest things I've gotten the opportunity to photograph in the last two years has been lesser prairie chickens in the Texas, uh, west, northwest Texas and New Mexico. Mm-hmm. That has been super, super cool. Uh, I'll describe it to you. It's, it's something like out of an alien world because you're sitting in your pop-up line and you're on this like sandy, you know, sand dune mm-hmm. lek. Uh, there's the vegetation's like doesn't even come up to your knee, but there's like it looks like a dead world it, in like Mars or something. And you're sitting there in the pitch dark in the morning, and all of a sudden you just hear these things flying in, and then they land. And it's these male prairie chickens coming. It's like 30 minutes before light, they start to cackle <laughs> and like evil laugh kind mm-hmm. of thing. It's it's eerie, and like if you don't know what they are, like it would terrify you. I mean. It's just strange, strange birds. And they start cackling and challenging each other. And then you start to hear them booming. And it's mm-hmm. like water running off like a board or something and, and just a weird sound. But then you hear them stomping their feet and just, you know, going at it. And it's so cool to see. I never thought in my, you know, I'm only 23. I never thought I would be able to photograph such a display, yeah. you know, at my early age. And so I actually got to photograph prairie chickens with my dad. Um, we've done it the last two years. And like, that's been super special to share that moment with him. Mm-hmm. Um, just, just us, you know, out in the photo blind photograph things, something that people never see in Texas. Like few people have ever seen prairie chickens, even, you know, just the bird, let alone them doing these amazing breeding displays and getting able to, being able to document that has just been super, super cool. And just recently this year, they've been listed as endangered. Mm -hmm. So like the two populations, they've just, uh, Fish and Wildlife has declared one population endangered and another population is threatened in Texas. So now it, it may never happen again. Like we may never even be able to get close to them. So I'm, I'm really glad we had the blessing to get to do that the last mm-hmm. two years before before that listing's enacted. Yeah, that's crazy, man. That's that's one of the bummers of when you get into this world is for all the great success stories, there's on the flip side another story of like what you just mentioned of something's getting endangered or putting on the danger list and it's like, Man, it's frustrating because everybody, like so many people are working so hard all the time. Yeah. And then the majority of people don't care. (laughs) Yeah. And it's, I mean, and it's something that's heartbreaking is like there were so many of them before, Mm -hmm. like in historical times, like there were so many prairie chickens and now it's like there's barely any and the habitat that is just gone. There's very fragmented areas that they can even survive anymore. So, I mean, I would love to see, you know, at a time in my career, especially when prairie chickens are, you know, abundant again, mm-hmm. I would love to see that. Cause I would love to, I want people to share, or share in the experience that I've been able to see and like, you know, get to see a prairie chicken doing its, you know, mating calls and stuff. I mean, that, that to me, that's why I got into the wildlife mm-hmm. profession. I just, I want to be able to share that with people and I think photography is really going to complement my career in wildlife, uh, the wildlife field, because, you know, I get to document the things I see and I get to share that with other people, at least in that way. I think for me, photography shaped me as a hunter because I was a photographer before I was a hunter. Mm-hmm. So I had the the passion of like taking wildlife photography much, much earlier than I got into hunting, which was only like six years ago. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it's interchangeable. 
but I, I, the ethic that I've gained from photography first is like, I'm not really super concerned with like having to kill something. Mm-hmm. Like I, it's, yeah. it's great for, you know, consumption, food. I mean, I, I hunt because I like to eat wild game and I think it's just a better system of getting my own food. I can't speak for the rest of the world, but that's just my <laughs> ethic. And like, I'm not really just a fan of just shooting stuff. Like I could care less. Mm-hmm. Like I had the opportunity to shoot raccoons last night. I was like, I, I don't want to just shoot something. Like it does nothing for me. Oh yeah. And so, I mean, you can make all the predator control arguments and stuff, but I'm like, it just doesn't appeal to me. Mm-hmm. But with a camera, you get that same thing. And it, it really just shaped the way I think about it because I was like, well, what's the difference if I was just sitting out here with a camera? There is no difference. There's just a more severe end game for the, what's on the other side of that blind or that that gun or a camera with with hunting. So, oh yeah, and I mean, you don't have to deal with the mess afterwards. Mm-hmm. You don't have to, you know, you're not getting that wild game meat for sure. But you also, it's it it's a lot more affordable. I would say in today's day and age, it's like. I, I can photograph this, you know, 180 inch white tailed deer for like as long as I want. Yeah. And, you know, he's still here. Yeah. But if I, you know, I can't pay that to harvest that deer. So yeah. I don't have 10 grand. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, and I mean, it's so much more affordable. And it's uh, photography really has, you know, opened the doors to many unique opportunities for me. And it's, you know, I think it will continue to do so. Um, but just like, just like that, it's like you, I wouldn't go on certain properties because I couldn't afford a hunt or I couldn't even afford to shoot a hog probably. Mm -hmm, Um, but I can afford, I mean, I can give that landowner photos and, you know, tell them what I see and, you know, just kind of be an, like a, an agent for them. And it's like, yeah, this is what I saw. This is what the deer are doing. Um, you know, they appreciate that information. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, that's sort of like the exchange. It's like, you know, and I'm not taking anything from mm-hmm. their, their property. I'm just taking photos. Hey, what's up everyone? James Appleton here, co-founder of Absolute Aid. Welcome to the Seek to Do More program. This program will help you help yourself by developing the daily habits that will elevate your entire life. Over the next 30 days, you'll complete the doers list every single day. And the doers list includes one, do something physical. Two, follow and stick to your diet of choice. Three, read a real book. Four, further your education on purpose. Five, dedicate time to your spiritual life. And six, dedicate time to your hobbies. So if you're ready to take a structured, proven approach to build the daily habits that will allow you to get the most out of yourself, your time, and your life every single day, the Seek to Do More program is your blueprint. So make a choice, commit to yourself, sign up below, and let's get started. So, and people probably are turned off by photography a lot because it's not cheap. Yeah. It's not cheap, but at the same time, people are buying like custom built ARs with suppressors mm-hmm. and stuff to hunt. That's also not cheap. But I think hunting is still more affordable because you're not buying 15 cameras. You're yeah. buying like one. <laughs> I mean, I have I have an old setup that I still absolutely love for wildlife photography. It's just a full frame Nikon with a 600 millimeter lens and I beat the living piss out of that thing. I drag (laughs) it all over the place and I love it. It's not the most expensive setup, but I'll put my photos of taken up against anyone with that Mm -hmm. cheaper camera. But you know, you can get as crazy with it as you want. I started out with the starter bundle from Nikon, whatever it comes with the 300 millimeter lens. And Mm -hmm. it wasn't great, but I took a lot of photos with that and I learned how to get close to animals instead of being able to hide, you know, a tenth of a mile away and still get a sweet zoomed in shot. Oh yeah. I learned so much doing that. And that's, you can buy a $350 camera. Exactly. Go go to town. Exactly. And your phone too is a quality camera as Mm -hmm. well. I mean, they're, they're getting more and more developed with each, with each upgrade. And I mean, like you said, you can go and buy a very good quality camera for 300, you know, if you're willing to spend like upwards of 500 to a thousand dollars, like that's a great camera. Um, It'll last a long time. Too, yeah. Unless I mean, you drop it in the lake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't go swimming in the river with it. <laughs> but um, like my first images that I ever had published were photos taken with like a Rebel T3i. Mm-hmm. I mean, which is like, gosh, I don't even know what the cost of that camera is now. It's probably worth dirt. Yeah. So <laughs> you couldn't give it away. Exactly. Like, yeah. I still have it and yeah. I probably couldn't give it away. 
Do, do your cameras, like, I don't know, a lot of people buy and sell cameras all the time. They're always on the newest trend. Do you, do you have cameras and you just keep them because they hold sentimental value for no reason? <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, I mean, I keep them just kind of as backups, but I think, uh, you know, there is sentimental value. It's like, oh, that dent was in Alaska. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it is also like, that was a terrifying yeah. moment. <laughs> I thought I broke it. Yeah, I thought I screwed up a lens and it's like I dropped that in the in Denver airport. <laughs> Do you have any um, tips for maybe people that are, you know, maybe they're interested in wildlife photography because again, just like with hunting, cameras are very intimidating to a lot of people because mm-hmm. there's a bunch of buttons and switches and a lot of people I think buy a camera and they hit the auto button and they're like, yes. Oh yeah. But it's, I always say like if my dumb ass can figure it out, Anybody can figure it out. It's not the complicated part is the artistic part of framing good shots. I feel like the balance of the camera settings is if you take like two weeks to learn it, I feel like it's just not that hard. I mean, for sure. I think the hardest part is like just getting to know your equipment and know it well enough that like when you're in the field, you can make those quick decisions because wildlife photography is difficult. It's a very Mm -hmm. difficult subject. And, you know, I do shoot on like auto ISO and stuff like that because I mean, you you have to, you have to, you don't have the time to like think about, oh, well, like 30 minutes ago, this ISO was good. And like now that's changed. Mm -hmm. The lights faded, like it's a shadow now. So it's going to be dark. Um, And I think I've, I've heard lots of conversations uh, with, from people that are like they're portrait photographers or somebody else, and they're like, "Oh, you you don't shoot on like manual mode all the time, and like don't shoot on like this ISO setting, or like you you said shoot on auto." And I'm like, "Yeah, because I'm not a portrait photographer. Yeah. I can't control like every little aspect of the photo like you can." Yeah, um, I have one second to make a decision. Yeah, that, and then that animal's gone. They're gone. Yeah. And so, I mean, you have to really be um, keyed in on your settings. And that's probably the biggest piece of advice I can give to anybody beginning is like, look up YouTube videos. I mean, there's millions of videos out there that explain, you know, this cam- every camera model and settings you could possibly think of. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then and then some, you know, and then to to show you like what all of what all, what all can be done with that equipment, because there's still stuff I learn on a daily basis. It's like, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Like, but, you know, just playing with that equipment and in the field, you know, practicing shots and shooting is really key. And yeah, just spending as many hours in the field as you possibly can learning about it. I It will save on frustration later. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I would literally suggest sitting in a room with the camera and practice changing all of the settings quickly mm-hmm. and like understanding. And it's funny because after a while you just under, like you like I don't even think about it anymore. I like I know what I'm trying to capture and I know what setting I need and it's just like oh yeah boom. you and you'll get to the that point where it's like you can just see a setting or like see a landscape and you're like I know what I want the settings to be. Yeah. You know and you know and then you can adjust for it as the light fades, mm-hmm. you know, but and that's there's a lot of work to be said that goes into setting up the perfect shot. Yes. Uh, especially with like photo blind so photo blind setup you know, being cognizant of like, what is, where do you want that animal to emerge from? Mm -hmm. So like we look at game trails, we look at, uh, we have some game cameras that we set up just to know what's coming in. Um, And then, you know, we do some baiting and stuff to bring in animals because I like, you know, the argument is a lot of people are like, well, you bait, that's that's not real, real hunting or anything, but you wouldn't even know what you had on a property had you not like, some of these 10,000 acre ranches, like there's deer that like you don't even know exist. Yeah. Like they don't come to feeders and you only know them from one picture on a game camera, but you know, they're out there. Well, it's funny hearing, I guess it's not funny. It's different hearing wildlife photographers talk about ethical photography Mm -hmm. when you're a hunter. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, well, if I was out there hunting, the ethical part goes out the window other than the fact of like, you know, I'm not going to just shoot stuff or whatever. Like you, we talk about ethics. It's like my end goal is to kill the animal. Mm-hmm. So if we're talking ethics, I'm yes, I want it to be, you know, quick, painless as possible for the animal, like not screw up as much as possible. And then they talk about ethics with photography. I'm like, the only you're removing the killing part and it's a whole different ball game. But I just people like to argue about stuff. And I I mean there should be ethics in photography in some sec, but it's like 
there's to me it's no different like if you want to see an animal you have to find out where it's at and call mm-hmm. it in or figure out what it's doing like yeah so you're very very lucky if they just show up out of nowhere with no yeah i mean you'd be sitting there for days sometimes and you still wouldn't see anything mm-hmm. so i mean it can it just i think it all depends a lot on the environment and like you said there is no code of ethics like standardized yeah. for photography so that is something to like kind of you know for me it's like there's a Every year where I live, this owl comes and like roosts in this one area and it has its babies and it's like pretty like clockwork almost. It's mm-hmm. in this general area. Nobody has a problem when there's like 70 photographers sitting under this thing for five <laughs> hours taking photos. It's like, but if I use a turkey call, people are like, no, 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 no. I'm like, yeah. how is that different? Like you're stressing the animal out. I was like, other turkeys are making the same noise and trying to fight him. Mm-hmm. I'm not even, I'm just taking a quick photo. Yeah. I mean, I guess you could argue either way. Like, I, People are going to complain about things just to com- for the sake of complaining. So, <laughs> I mean, so I've heard so many arguments that it's just like, I don't even know what you're talking about now. <laughs> well, yeah, people like to complain. I, it was funny. I was, I was laughing a little bit ago because you talked about portrait photographers in a controlled studio using like, Three thousand dollar piece lights, mm-hmm. and backdrops, and and, and then they know, criticize us. And then they <laughs> criticize you know wildlife <laughs> photographers. And I was like, I just crossed my mind. I was like, portrait photographers are the fly fishermen of photographers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very very much so. We're better. We're superior. And it's like, yeah, calm down. <laughs> yeah, it's like I have my I have my eighteen thousand dollar camera body in my perfectly lit studio, and I photoshopped this photo for six hours. Yeah, and I'm like, dude, I rolled up with like a fifteen hundred dollar camera and just started hammering on the shutter button, <laughs> <laughs> like Rambo versus you know. <laughs> and, yeah, and that's another thing too is like the. The degree that you can change a photo now in Photoshop is scary. I mean, you could just completely manipulate a photo beyond whatever it was. I mean, you know, it's it's not even photography anymore. It's just like you're good at a computer program. Mm-hmm. And I mean, there's, that has a place and like that's, you know, that's fine for a lot of things. But you can't manipulate a wildlife photo because, heck, we know what a deer looks like. Yeah. We know yeah. that's not the right shade of color for like a turkey, you know. We know you manipulated that photo. And that, that's that's what a lot of social media is nowadays. I mean, it's there's not a single photo out there that's not been cropped or manipulated. But I do very little editing. I do, the most I ever do is like a crop and a maybe a little color adjustment to just kind of brighten the color or something. Yeah. I mean, and if you shoot in flat or whatever, or whatever settings are in there and raw, I mean, it's, it's going to come out looking a little white most of the time. Mm-hmm. It's like a, a little overexposed almost. Mm-hmm. And I go, when I edit a photo, I want it to look how I saw it, you know, like sure. in the wild, like I saw this turkey's feathers shimmering and I want like, I want you to see that. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, yeah, the coloring stuff is amazing, but like I try not to overdo it. Yeah. Maybe, I mean, it's more appealing if you push the saturation of hair just to give people like, oh, that's a really colorful animal. Sure. So, but that's what they look like, you know? Sure. And it's hard. It is hard. And, you know, I do, with wildlife photography, it's tough because even with a six or 800 millimeter lens, you're still really far away. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, cropping is whatever. And now the, even the freaking megapixels on a camera are just <laughs> oh, it, asinine. Like if I took a picture of you right here, I could like crop into the black part of your eyeball and it would still look perfectly great. Oh yeah. It's, it's amazing how far technology has come with the cameras and mm-hmm. like the iPhone cameras too, especially it's like, uh, some people show me there every time I show people photos, they're like, did you take that with your iPhone? I'm like, no, it was actually with a three thousand dollar camera. Yeah, exactly. But <laughs> glad you think that. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, as long as it's getting more people outside taking photos of wildlife, I guess that's pretty cool. Sure, and I mean the citizen science applications too, like involving more of the public in like photography and you know using some of these apps like iNaturalist and stuff and taking photos and documenting those um, encounters. It definitely is. It's it's a data set, mm-hmm. you know, and I think it has it has value in certain contexts. So what's your favorite lens to use for wildlife photography? I mean, I don't care about name brand or whatever. Like mm-hmm. we're talking like like focal length and all that stuff. Yeah, so the lens I've fallen in love with for wildlife photography is this um, Canon L-series 100 to 400. Uh, that, a lot of people are using the 400. 
it's because you have such a great range. I mean, 100 to 400. And I mean, it's, it's perfect for big game animals too. Like when I'm in a pop-up blind and that deer walks within 20 yards, it's like, okay, he's way too close now yeah, for most true. of most lenses. Like his entire eyeball fills the frame. Um, <laughs> but you know, you having that different range, it really helps with wildlife photography. Cause like you said, you're trying to get as close as possible. Uh, and that's what quality, the quality images are going to get produced by getting as close as possible. Um, I will say though, I, we do have a cool, our family has a 500 millimeter lens and that one's really fun to work with. It's just so freaking heavy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I've been lugging around a 150 to 600. Mm -hmm. That's a workout, man. Mm -hmm. That thing is like the, it's all lens. There's no camera body. It's oh, just yeah. like, it, it's weird, <laughs> but I don't know. I think some of the best photographers I know have shitty equipment. Mm -hmm. They just kill it because they know how to take a good photo. Mm -hmm. People get hung up on it. Like you can easily go out and buy a $7,500 Sony mm. body and have a oh, $5,000 yeah. lens. Mm. <laughs> or you can just go to Best Buy or whatever local store and get whatever they have and just go to town. Yeah. I would say the hardest part nowadays is just finding equipment that you want. Like finding things in stores now is just so hard. You almost have to buy secondhand equipment, yeah. you know, lightly used, hopefully. Um, that's how I got like my, my most recent purchase was a Canon 5D Mark IV body. Uh, I found it on Facebook Marketplace for a great deal. But with all the development of mirrorless cameras now, you know, a lot of people are switching over to just pure mirrorless. And so like a person like me who doesn't really, can't really afford mirrorless right now in my um, it with my income, mm -hmm. I'm like, hey, I can buy this DSLR for like you know half the cost, yeah. and it's a great camera. I mean, heck, it's does everything I want it to do. Does so if you're doing stuff out in a blind, how does does the sh the sound of the actual mechanical shutter mess with your photography at all, or are they pretty unconcerned with that? I would say most of the time they're very unconcerned because they get habituated to it so regularly. Like when a deer first walks out, I'm not hammering down the shutter. You know, I'm not because yeah. that will freak them out. But if I can get a deer and I can like habituate him, there's some deer that are so gentle, like they just get so used to it. They're like, they don't even look up anymore. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm this last season, I had one deer in particular, beautiful deer. Um, big mainframe, 12 point. And I was just like, he just would not look up for the life of him. So I'm in the blind and I'm just like, I'm grunting at him. Like, eh, eh, eh. and like, he still wouldn't look up. I was just like, good gosh, like this Throw deer a rock is, at him. literally, I mean, <laughs> I was ready to like hit a, like crinkle a water bottle, hit a pole or something like a metal sound. Mm -hmm. Cause that metal sounds will for sure get them nervous. And that, that could ruin a sit really quickly. So, um, I try to, I just try to do like a light grunt or something just to get them to look up for like in that perfect moment. It's like, all right, he's in the perfect sunlight. He's got the perfect portraits, you know, uh, style or whatever. He's at his best angle and there's a deer walking behind him. It's like, yeah. look up now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, one of the things that I, I enjoy about photography in general is like people are so grateful when you give them a good photo like most people are used to like shitty self I, mean, I shouldn't say shitty but most people are used to like phone selfie photos mm -hmm. and like you give them like a high quality like photo that the, of them mm -hmm. and they're like oh thank <laughs> you and that like people just are always grateful for that like even here just run around and be like here's a picture of you with that giant bass they're like oh yeah they don't get, and nobody gets that. Nobody takes photos like that. And, and I'd say like for, especially in my work with like wild in the wildlife field, it's a great asset to have a good photographer with like on your field Absolutely. project. Cause like so much of that is not documented uh, or like all you have is your cell phone. And so like, if you can have quality photos of like your research of your study animal, I mean, that's all going to be super, super important when you're like, when the time comes for publishing, uh, for writing articles, for presenting at, you know, conferences and stuff. And there, I have people come to me all the time. They're like, I don't have any pictures of my project, like any. And I'm like, you should have invited me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like we're but, looking for stuff to take photos of too. Yeah, and like I've been able to contribute to a lot of my friends' projects that you know I've gotten to work on. So um, the the 
project I did or the internship I did at the Rolling Plains Quail Research Ranch, I provided them a lot of photos of quail and other wildlife on the ranch. And they still use those photos to this day um, in their annual reports um, and social media. So, I mean, I'm very honored to, it's super satisfying to see your, your work being appreciated like that. I mean, it's just that little dopamine dosage that yeah. like you need to like to continue forever. And yeah. it's like, it's very gratifying. Do you, I don't know, how hard is it to make it as a, you know, as a wildlife photographer in this day and age? Because a lot of this stuff has been, I don't want to say cheapened, but it's been like a lot of people will work for free now for things just because they're like, it's, there's a lot of people doing it now because it's a lot more accessible. Mm-hmm. But that's something that I've been trying to think of, like, how do you make any money doing this? I know people that do it, but like, I don't know how they do it. Yeah. I mean, it's extremely hard. It's extremely hard to just be full-time photographer. You have to be very open to lots of different um, styles of photography. I think you have to like, you know, be be open to photographing like the occasional wedding or like the reality photography. I mean, stuff that makes a lot more money than just wildlife photography, because uh, it is. It's a very um, very hard business to stay in because there's very little stability in it. Mm-hmm. Um, And I think, but if you can apply like other skill sets to your photography, like if you can, if you're a good writer and you can do like magazine articles with compliments, your photography, that's like, that's what editors are looking for nowadays because magazines and stuff do not hire a lot of full-time photographers anymore. It's all freelance. So you have to be, you have to be able to communicate with editors and have that network and maintain that network and, you know, constantly building the relationship and sending them stuff and hopefully it's stuff that they need at that time or else it's just going to sit on your computer forever. Yeah. Uh, and that's the hardest thing to think about is like, Oh, I've got pictures of Alaskan brown bears with like salmon in their mouth. It's like, no one's ever seen these because you know, yeah. I don't have those kind of connections yeah. Yeah. Um, that, you know, want to publish them. So that's, that's probably the hardest part is because there's so much self-motivation in photography business. Like you have to stay self-motivated all the time because heck, you're not going to get that kind of, you're not going to have someone in your corner all the time telling you your stuff is good. And when you see like 50 likes on Instagram for your amazing photo and like a brown sparrow on Instagram got like a thousand likes, you're like, what the heck? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. It's tough, but I mean, you have to love it. You have to do Mm -hmm. it. It's the same thing with like podcasting or whatever. It's like, you have to enjoy learning and talking to people about stuff that you're interested in. Oh yeah. Or it's like, why am I doing it? Yeah. And I mean, it's opened so many doors and gotten me access to places and see, lets me see things I've never thought I'd ever see in my lifetime. So there are some extremely, um, satisfying deals. And, and when you you see like that quarter inch photo of, of yours in a magazine, it's like, I'm good for another year. Like, yeah. heck yeah. Like, and then you're motivated. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, and it's like, I've taken the time to do my best to understand duck hunting. Okay. There is places by me that are invite only clubs that I will never have the chance to access, but I could go up to him and say, Hey, can I give you guys some photos? If I can go sit with some of your hunters for a day, Uh huh. I could access and a place that is currently unreachable to me by providing them with something valuable to them. Because a lot of these places, they don't need a good website. They don't have good photos because they don't care. Mm-hmm. But they, they would sure like them, I'm sure, to have for their, like, we're in this ranch right now to hang up and be like, this was ex-CEO guy came here and hunted, and we have just happened to have a great photo of him. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm, exactly providing value to people. You will get you into places that you never thought you'd be able to go. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I've had the the conversation I had with uh, Dr. Dale Rollins, who was like Amazing, hiring yeah. hired me for the Rolling Plains internship. He said he's told me several times. He's like, Joe, I hired you because I knew you're a great photographer, mm-hmm. and you know, I took an investment on you because I knew you would run around with a camera and you would provide some quality images for us for years to come. And you know. Sure enough, he was right. And, you know, that that's been a huge uh, blessing in my life just to see my stuff being used like that by an, an organization that I care about. And, you know, just for someone to see that skill set in me and to, you know, take appreciation for it was just you know, 
very, very humbling and very cool. Well, I'm going to wrap up here. We've got more podcasts to do. We've got a lot of fun stuff coming throughout the rest of the day. So uh, if you want people to find you on social media and stuff where they can view your photos, Mm -hmm. where can they find you, man? So I'm on Instagram and Facebook. So my Instagram handle is Richard's Outdoor Photo. Uh, My Facebook is very similar. It's Richard's Outdoor Photography. So if you have uh, any interest, we'd appreciate a follow and a like, and you can see all the cool things that I've gotten to experience over the years. So, All right, man. Well, I'm stoked. Hopefully by the time before you leave here or I leave here, we can go out and take some photos together because I know not that many people are photographers. Yeah. Well, I brought my camera, so let's do it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.